little bit subdued during our writing process with the whole city life. The Rev found out for himself. He kind of went AWOL for a little bit to lock himself up and write. Not right! I did the same, you know, I just had to clear my head and so I kind of disappeared for a while and just wrote on my own. And it kind of hit Matt a little bit after it hit us that he needed to get away from all the noise and create some noise of our own. So he came up with the idea of heading up to a cabin in Big Bear. Everybody was up in uh, Big Bear at M. Shadow's cabin. Because we were just getting bugged too much by neighbors and family and fans and friends. You know, we've come a long way and achieved some success. And coming to Huntington Beach and riding isn't necessarily the same as it was several years ago. We had a little bit of a riding process up there to kind of get away from everybody in Orange County. We wanted to clear our heads and get up there in the mountains where there's just nothing around you and we could just be inspired by each other. Sinister and the Rev had this band called Pinkly Smooth. It was just primarily goblin metal, heavily Danny Elfman influenced, as well as Oingo Boingo. When Jimmy decided he was going to write on this record, he didn't know how to write Avenged Sevenfold style stuff. And we're like, you don't understand, like, we are Avenged Sevenfold, we can write whatever we want. So the first thing he came to us with was Afterlife. We're like, Afterlife's a great song, but make something crazier. Try to write outside the box, like, pinkly smooth stuff. And uh, one night, the Rev started playing this piano line that had been in his head and he had been working on at home. He's like, okay, just give me a keyboard. And so I had set the keyboard, the little motif rack, and. He's like, just press record. And so he started playing this, this thing with one finger and adding another finger. So he plays like one note at a time. <laughs> plays the song for eight minutes all the way through with one hand. And he's like, okay, now start me over again and give me a left hand. So then he does left hand just ding, ding. Just like these little chords, right? So then he's like, okay, now record me on the drums. Press record on the drums and he just plays this crazy beat over this piano. Right, and it's just going crazy, and we're just like, okay. And then add some bass notes, and all of a sudden we have piano and drums with a little bit of a melody in the chorus, and that was it. So we have eight minutes of just like piano, one left hand, one right hand, nothing spectacular. We didn't know what we were getting there. Then he's like, okay, get, takes the mic, and he's like, now give me a, a track on the microphone. So we give him a track on the microphone, and he's just whispering these melodies. And it just sounds like this eight minute, 50 second collage of different ridiculous stuff. When I first heard it, I fucking had no idea what to think. I thought, okay, well, this is cool. The rest is crazy now. Why? Whatever, we got other good songs that are gonna be on the album. Matt just heard this piano and the melody that Jimmy was singing, flipped out. It was like number one on Matt's list to make sure this thing happens. I just didn't get it. No one really wanted to work on it because it was this big ordeal to work on. Even one point, Jimmy came to me, he's like, we shouldn't even record Big Bear. I don't want to record it. When we went to record it for real, and I was like, dude, God record Big Bear, dude. If, if not for any other reason, but I want to listen to it. Matt wasn't having it. He was adamant that we needed to let Jimmy just do what he was going to do, and we all just needed to work together. Yeah, turn up one of the tracks. Yeah. It was really um, very different from anything we've done. Jimmy, who's a mastermind, was thinking at a thousand miles a second about these cool melodies and the storyline and writing lyrics for this thing. You must have stabbed it 50 fucking times, you know, it's such a cool line, do you know yeah. when he sings it? The Rev got these lyrics that were kind of twisted and funny at the same time. It's basically a story about a man murdering his significant other and preserving her to do whatever he pleases with her. And the story takes a twist. She comes back from the grave and kills him. And they go on this murderous rampage. They're both dead souls together and they get married and terrorize everyone else. As it started to come together, the song was just so amazing and uh, we definitely wanted to make it a special song for everyone um, as it was special to us. Totally inspired by all the crazy shit that we listen to, all of us, uh, ranging from bands like Mr. Bungle and The Residents. That's another one of those magical things that as it just progressed in the studio, such as the string arrangements, the orchestral arrangements brought to you by many members of uh, Oingo Boingo. Mark Mann said, I'm gonna call Steve Bartek to work on this song and do horn arrangements. 
And I said, yeah, let me, let me involve Steve Bartek, the guitar player from Boingo, and get him to do some horns and stuff. So we're like, Steve Bartek, fuck yeah. Like, Mark Mann and Steve Bartek, the dudes from Oingo Boingo who do all Danny Elfman's stuff are gonna work on this song with us. Bringing in guest musicians is always a, a great thing. So we went into uh, Capitol Records building in Hollywood. We put some great brass on and strings on. Working with them was awesome because they just bring a, a great deal to the table, like shit I couldn't come up with myself. We have brass and, and woodwinds, and we've never had that on a record before. Trumpets, trombones, saxophones, and clarinets. We, we had a full brass choir, orchestra. It's just an epic piece of just great musical material and proportions. You have the live players and, and they hear it and it's like oompa, 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 and it's like this great sounding brass and these big chorales. Uh, they were just grinning ear to ear and loving the sound of it. Once that was on there, then I'm like, wow, this is something great, bigger than we've ever done. Added some choir today here at El Dorado Studios. Yesterday was the day that we really got to put all the fun stuff, the laughing and the, the yelling. And, and the whole band came together. We had Zach doing the wedding ceremony. Of your eternal life. You know, the deep vocals, I'm the, the minister. And then we started laying down vocals, and the lyrics have this ridiculous, crazy content to them. Okay, kids, let's roll it. <laughs> I sang the main vocal. Before the story begins, is it such a sin for me to keep what's mine until the end of time? Jimmy's singing the narrator part. We had a girl named Juliet come in and, and sing. She was amazing. She just played the part perfectly. It reminded me of like a movie soundtrack. Yeah, like... That's great, let's do the giggle now. <laughs> the idea was we wanted a Halloween type of vibe. You know, me and Jimmy have a good time together. He's just a crazy fucking guy. And Come here, you fucking bitch! <laughs> Let me hear it back. <laughs> yeah, dude, we need to get some bottles breaking and shit. We would turn our ideas like, oh, let's have the murderers go in there and chance like, eat it, eat it. <laughs> All these funny things that we just fucking came up with on the spot, and me and Jimmy were just going in there fucking going crazy. That's all you see, fucking Shut up, And it just kept evolving and kept evolving. We were having so much fun with it. It just turned out to be beyond anybody's uh, wildest expectations. I think it was like a gift to us because I don't think anyone wanted to put in the work on it until things started really happening with it. It's just unbelievable to see the vision that Jimmy and Matt had had and see it come to life. Definitely have a stronger sense of, of pride in your accomplishment after self-producing. I'm amazed that it's over.